Hello, it's a me, Thought Slime. Regular viewers of this Yarn Tube channel will know that I have worked a variety of crummy jobs in the past. Just a bunch of real rotten jobs, let me tell you. Now I know this may come as somewhat of a shock to you. Having once said the words Burger King in a funny way, it would appear that I'd never worked in fast food or retail or anything really below a C-level executive at Exxon Valdez. Exxon Valdez nuts! Hmm. Burger King. Today I'd like to discuss what were hopefully my final series of crummy jobs. I had more jobs after this, but they weren't like bad ones. After this, I went on to be an underpaid copywriter and an overpaid YouTube communist. Also, I spent a few years as a part-time stand-up comedian and full-time unemployed person. None of those were bad jobs exactly. I mean, being unemployed was a nightmare, but it wasn't so much a job that was the problem, but more so the lack of a job. I say series of jobs because although this video will cover a bunch of different positions at a bunch of different companies, not all of whom I will name, they were all more or less the same job. I worked as a mobile phone salesperson and I was not very good at it. Before I get to that though, I want to mention a couple jobs I worked very little time at because they don't deserve their own videos, but I figured I, sh I would mention them. Firstly, I worked about a week at Toys R Us and that was by far the most miserable I've ever been at any workplace. To the point that I quit in disgust, like a week in. In addition to the regular ways that working retail sucks, Toys R Us has a policy where every customer whose purchase exceeds a certain threshold, it was like, I think 25 bucks or something, no matter what they were purchasing, must be offered a warranty. Whether they're buying batteries or diapers or video games or Bakugan battle brawlers, you had to ask them if they wanted to buy a useless warranty and your manager would be breathing down your neck to make sure that you did. One day, an incredibly pregnant woman was buying a baby seat for her car. Now, if you work at Toys R Us, you have a lot of info about baby seats. You are trained to know the provincial law that any baby seat is returnable for any reason for up to one year, which so happens to be the amount of time that our warranty covered. However, there were no exceptions to the warranty policy. So even though the warranty was entirely useless, we were under orders to offer it to everyone. In this case, I didn't, because fuck that. This woman, however, was a conscientious, expectant mother and wanted to make sure she was doing the best for her baby. She looked over the warranty flyer at the checkout and she asked me, point blank, to my face, do you think the warranty is worth it for this car seat? And a manager was standing within earshot, but still I said, no, not really. You, you won't get anything from it because you know, I'm a human being and I don't want to help Toys R Us steal money from this nice lady for no reason for the horrible crime of being pregnant. So my manager waited for her to leave and then chewed me out and told me I was not performing my job duties. So I asked him, okay, how was I supposed to sell a warranty that literally did nothing? Like, how was I supposed to answer the question, why do I need this to her? And his response was, well, that's your job figure it out. So I quit, not in a cool way, like I didn't have a cool showdown with him where I was like, well, I won't do this, sir. And I threw my, you know, little apron in his face or whatever. I just called the next day and said I wasn't coming in. And when I went to collect my paycheck, the guy who chewed me out gave me the biggest stink eye I've ever received. And I've received my fair share. So that's that. I also worked at a Starbucks and that was kind of great, to be honest. Like, the customers were terrible, just the most entitled rude assholes you'd ever want to meet. But the job itself was fine. Tons of breaks, tons of free stuff, like all the free drinks you can shake a stick at, even though like official policy was not really to do that. But like you could just give away free drinks to whoever. They had a button on the cash register for giving away drinks and they had a very flexible schedule. I, I had no real complaints about that whatsoever. I mentioned that one because like you might get the impression I'm a whiner or a complainer. Very astute observation, indeed I am, but I'm not impossible to please. It's not like I just hate jobs as a rule. Okay, moving on to the cell phones. I was hired to sell cell phones, as well as home phone service cable and internet for Bell Canada. Every single Canadian right now is booing and hissing and throwing tomatoes at their screen. You see, Bell does not have a good reputation, and that's because it does not deserve a good reputation. 
But in Newfoundland, they had an especially bad reputation. They bought out the largest telecommunications firm in the province, Alliant, and rebranded it as Bell Alliant, and then eventually swallowed it whole to become just Bell. Alliant had very normal cell phone plans, tons of minutes, which were a thing at the time, kids, ask your parents what cell phone minutes were, unlimited text, and for a reasonable fee, unlimited data. Bell, however, had Canadian cell phone plans, which are literally the worst on earth. Don't believe me? Right now, if you wanted to get a cell phone with Bell, assuming you bought the phone outright, you'd be looking at $35 a month for a call and text plan, or a special promotional price of $75 a month for a data plan with unlimited data. 10 gigabytes of which are at top speed. Don't worry about what that means, it's unlimited. It's, it's just only 10 gigs are at the top speed. It's unlimited, only 10, but the thing, the, don't worry about what the other speeds are. That's not important. The important thing is it's unlimited. I mean, if you wanna buy more top speed, you can. I don't, you don't really need to, of course. It's unlimited, but you know, you can. And it sounds kinda like Canada is a lucrative market where any competitor could sweep in and undercut Bell's prices. Right? Well, Bell has two major competitors on the Canadian cell phone market, and I promise this diversion is more interesting than it sounds. Telus and Rogers. All three of these companies, by an astonishing coincidence, offer the exact same rate plans, and also, if one of them raises or lowers their prices, so too do the other two. In fact, the same promotional price I listed for Bell, wouldn't you know it, Rogers and Telus also have the exact same promotion going on. Also, all three of them operate a budget brand of cheaper phones and plans. Bell has Virgin, Telus has Kudo, and Rogers has Fido and also Chatter. Amazingly, these brands also have the exact same prices and promotions as one another. Isn't that weird? Don't you find that weird? Now, I'm not accusing any of these companies of price fixing, the illegal practice of colluding with business rivals to set the price of a good or service at a level by artificially controlling the entire supply. That, that would be a claim that they could take me to court over, so I'm not saying that. But why doesn't the invisible hand of the free market simply guide some daring entrepreneur to build a competitor? I'll tell you what, it's those blasted regulations. The Canadian nanny state regulates which radio frequencies are allowed to be used. There's a limited number of viable frequencies, and if they weren't managed, then one group could, in theory, just use all of them and have a complete telecommunications monopoly. When new frequencies are made available, they're auctioned off to the highest bidder, costing hundreds of millions of dollars each. Recent legislation has withheld some frequencies to be sold to smaller companies, not small companies, just smaller companies. But as of yet, this hasn't put much of a dent in the market. The biggest independent competitor, Wind Mobile, was also bought out by Canadian behemoth Shaw Media and rebranded as Freedom Mobile for extra Orwellian subtext. So we'll see how that goes, but it's worth noting that Freedom's network only covers some areas of the country, meaning that everywhere else it actually pays Rogers to use their network. So Rogers is getting paid either way. Suffice to say, Canadian telecoms haven't exactly created a very consumer-friendly environment. So you can imagine if you were a customer of Alliant before Bell bought them out, and you were paying a reasonable fee for your cell phone service, which you had grandfathered in, it would be a difficult proposition to get you to transition from that to a new shitty Bell plan. Also, any promotions you read about in the newspaper or see on TV commercials, sorry, you're not eligible for those. Only new customers get those promotions. You're not a new customer. You're, you're an old customer because you had service with another company that we bought. But if you'd like, we can sell you a new phone on a three-year contract for a shittier price than you're paying now with worse features for a nominal connection fee of $35. Keep in mind that right next door, our competitor is offering the same products at the same price. But since you're a new customer there, you'd be eligible for the promotional price we're refusing to give you for no reason. And according to Canadian federal law, we're obligated to release your phone number so you can switch to them. If you're a Canadian watching this video, if you take nothing else from what I am saying, never, ever renew your mobile phone service with the same company twice in a row. Always switch. You will always get a better deal if you switch. Always. 
This is the environment I sold cell phones in. You can imagine that doesn't exactly endear you to the people that you're serving. Your job was essentially to pretend like the service you were selling, which was exactly the same as your competitors, was somehow better or cheaper when it demonstrably was not. On top of that, when you sold a phone, you were obligated to upsell each customer, get them to buy a case for the phone, pay like 25 bucks in store for a little injection molded piece of plastic that you can get on Amazon for like two bucks, get them to buy a Bluetooth earpiece or a useless extended warranty that only covered manufacturing defects. The warranty cost five bucks a month, and what it did, you see, was extend the federally mandated one-year manufacturer's warranty for an extra year. So if you dropped your phone or got it wet, you couldn't get it repaired for free even though you paid for the warranty. What's more, even if there were some sort of manufacturer's defect, you better hope you didn't ever drop your phone or scuff it because any sign of damage immediately voided your warranty even if you continued to pay for it without noticing. Now, if you've ever worked sales, you know the scariest word in the English language is metrics. Here's just a sample of the metrics we were obligated to record. A complete list of sales and the ratio of sales with upsold goods and warranties versus sales without them. The ratio of returning customers versus new activations, which you just can't control. Your current sales versus your monthly average and also versus the store's monthly average. And my personal favorite, a complete list of people who entered the store who didn't buy anything and why not. And if they entered the store more than once, each time was recorded separately, bringing down your ratio. Now this particular store was inside a shopping mall, so whenever it got less busy, the expectation was that you'd leave the store and go out to random mall shoppers and convince them, sight unseen, to follow you back to your store and buy a cell phone from you. That way, it's also your fault if there's no customers that day. Now just play that scenario out in your mind's eye. You're walking out of American Eagle and some kid in a uniform approaches you and asks if you're satisfied with your cell phone service. And there's a one in three chance he works for the company you currently have cell phone service with. And even if he doesn't, he can't give you a better price or better plan because they're literally all the same. Now that might seem like a difficult sales position, but luckily Bell provided us with sales training that instilled in us a foolproof system that if followed guarantees a sale. If you didn't close the sale, you didn't follow the system. It went like this. First, you greet the customer with an NBO or non-business opener. Hi, I love your earrings. What can I help you with today? Then you ask open-ended questions to determine your customer's needs. What kind of features are you looking for in a cell phone? What are you gonna be using your phone for mostly? What do you like and dislike about your current phone? Then pick a phone which suits that need which you'll definitely have, and put it in their hands, you see, because studies showed that people are more likely to buy something if they've already touched it. Then you simply overcome their last minute resistance. And the way you do that is you convince them to buy the phone, despite not really wanting to. And then you're off to the races. Do that and you're guaranteed sales. One quick note, doesn't actually matter what the customer's needs are because we have a sweetheart deal with BlackBerry. Remember BlackBerry? And you have to push those first. Just identify the customer's needs and then ignore them and try to sell them a BlackBerry. Trust me, these Blackberries have the best features on the market. They practically sell themselves. There's nothing better. Actually, wait. BlackBerry ended their sweetheart deal with us. Sell Android phones. Those are the best ones on the market, even though Android phones can be anything from high-end brands like Samsung to shitty little HTC phones. They're the best ones because they pay the most and you'll make the most commission on them. Sell Android phones only. Try to talk them out of buying an iPhone, the only phone anyone actually wants. Just identify their needs. They don't need the phone that they want. They need the phone that we want to sell them. I left Bell one day after I came into work and my manager didn't show up because she decided to quit without saying anything. So my district manager was there to make sure she didn't steal anything. And he yelled at me for leaving a cabinet which didn't lock unlocked. It was full of phones, you see. So anyone could have broken into the building and known the cabinet was unlocked and full of phones and stolen them. And this was not the same store as the one in the shopping mall, mind you, this was in a building that locked each night. So didn't really seem like a big problem to me and also not in charge of the cabinets. 
But here's the thing, selling cell phones pays a lot better than most retail jobs. So my next job was with a Bell affiliate, a third party company that operated an independent Bell store. A week after I took that job, that company was bought out and every other employee but me quit. That left me in the uncomfortable position of being the interim manager and also being the only person working while the store was open from nine to nine each day but Sunday. I say working, but the store did not get customers. I maybe saw one a week if I was lucky. And this was like during Christmas time. However, we were still the busiest store in the chain of stores bought out by the new company and therefore in the province. So when the new company ran a sales competition promising the best salesperson in each province an award and brand new phone, I won it despite not really doing anything. And you better believe I milked the shit out of that on my resume for all it was worth. Eventually, I was able to hire a second employee who decided shortly after he wanted to go back to school so he could only work weekends. When I explained this to my corporate rep, he told me to let him go. I said I really didn't want to do that because I felt it was unfair that I wasn't being paid like a manager and therefore you really shouldn't ask me to fire employees, which sucks to do. So they offered to make me the manager permanently, but I didn't want to do that because I was bluffing and I just didn't want to fire someone, so I quit. A few years later, Target decided they were going to start operations in Canada. They bought out a huge series of Walmart-like department stores called Zellers and converted them all to Targets. And within these Targets, they had a mobile phone selling kiosk. So I was hired to work at one of those. We trained for like a month prior to getting the job, reviewing the exact same sales technique I was taught at Bell. We were also told we had to greet each customer, i.e. anyone who walked within 10 feet of the kiosk, immediately with the following phrase, hi, welcome to Target Mobile. This was imperative. The head of our department considered this a key priority. So just picture that everybody, you're shopping at Target and a Target employee walks up to you to welcome you to the aisle you're in. Do you feel at ease and ready to buy? When the store opened, they threw a red carpet gala and I kid you not, Sarah Jessica Parker was invited to walk around in a Target in a shitty area of Toronto to sell people on the idea that this was ritzy or glamorous. A fucking Target. She had two armed guards flanking her the entire time while she dragged around a shopping cart and waved at people with a glassy-eyed expression. I am not kidding or exaggerating. This happened to me. Anyway, the store was open for like two weeks and then I got fired. They wouldn't give me a reason why. It was either because I solicited drugs from another employee, satirically in the video game Minecraft, or because I told another employee to shut the fuck up when he insisted on describing the plot of JoJo's Bizarre Adventure to me over and over, or just because we never not once sold a fucking phone. About a month after that, Target pulled out of Canada, so it feels like they could have waited on that, but I don't know. I was a shitty employee and it was a fake pointless job. Last up, I worked at a mobile phone kiosk in a grocery store about an hour and a half from my home via public transit. Once again, the expectation was, if there were no customers around, to go out and find some and bring them back to the kiosk. Because nobody goes to the grocery store to buy a cell phone, right? So what you, your job was to wander the aisles of a grocery store, cold approaching people, and asking if they liked their cell phone plan, like a murderer. And I don't know what's wrong with me specifically. I mean, I have my guesses, don't get me wrong. But amazingly, every other employee managed to pull this off without a hitch. They could just walk up to anyone and get them to buy a phone. And I was the only one who struggled with it. Which was bizarre because they weren't like trained to do it or anything. They, they were the exact same as me. I don't know how they were able to do this. One time they had me stand at the entrance to the grocery store and greet each and every customer and hand them flyers and shit. I did it for two hours without a single bite. Another guy came out. He was like, no, 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 it's easy, watch. And he did the exact same thing I was doing word for word. And the first person he spoke to bought two phones from him. And that. That'll kill your confidence, let me tell you. So they fired me and I can't say I really blame them on that one. My boss approached me one day, asked to speak privately and handed me my walking papers. And my exact words were, yeah, that makes sense. He obviously didn't like having to do it though. And he was a little sweetheart because he then added me on LinkedIn and endorsed me for a bunch of skills that he must have known at that point I did not have. And that was my final foray into the world of crummy jobs, for now anyway. I'm hoping the crummy job portion of my life is over. I have a dream job at this moment, but it's also highly precarious. So 
We'll see. I still have stress dreams about these jobs where I have to go cover a shift because I forgot to quit like six years ago. And until now, they just forgotten to schedule me for another shift and I have to go in and do it. And I'm, and it just, it's, it's very stressful for me. And I don't know why in the dreams, I don't just like say no. Like I have a new job that I'm doing now. I'm not going to do it. Sorry. But I always go in and get stressed out in the dream. I was terrible at sales, but it was a better job than anything else I could get. So I just stuck with it as it got more and more demeaning and more and more clear that I couldn't hack it. And that's a very demoralizing feeling to feel trapped in an endless series of failed shitty jobs, shitty jobs that anyone should be able to do, but I can't. After that, I lucked my way into a couple of decent jobs that I don't want to cover in this series. I'll always be afraid of having to go back. I'll never really feel comfortable like I'm more than another couple months away from scouring every retail store and fast food joint in the area to find work. I hesitate to use the word trauma to describe my experience in shitty minimum wage jobs, but they have taken from me a sense of stability and safety, maybe forever. They've made me afraid of losing more of my life to an endless, miserable grind that keeps you underwater financially at all times. I always feel like my escape from that lifestyle is temporary, like I'm deluding myself into thinking it won't all come crashing down around me, slamming me back into a world where my dreams are far beyond my grasp. The only thing I have to look forward to is my next day off. And like, that shouldn't be that way, don't you think? Like, don't you think like everybody should be able to work for a living with dignity and in comfort? Don't you think that everybody should feel like they can spend their lives that are beneficial to themselves and their communities and doing things they nominally enjoy doing a little bit? Maybe the economy shouldn't be dependent on an enormous underclass of terminally exploited workers kept below the poverty line spending their lives in pointless drudgery. Something to think about. Anywho, hello and welcome to the Eyeball Zone. Here in the Eyeball Zone, we enforce the will of Lord Oculon, the visionary, by putting eyeballs on small leftist projects. No transition this week! because I bummed myself out too much. Whenever I talk about a shitty job I've had, weird bootlickers come out of the woodwork to tell me how I should just suck it up and accept having shitty jobs cheerfully. And nobody embodies this dog shit attitude more than Mike Rowe, the multimillionaire who lectures working people on how they ought to just endure whatever horrible job is imposed on them. That's why I got a lot of satisfaction out of watching small YouTuber Corporate Aesthetic take apart his whole grift bit by bit. I don't use this term lightly, but Mike Rowe, was destroyed with facts and logic. I thought I knew how bad Roe was from the amazing episodes of Citations Needed about him, but he's so much worse and so much griftier than I thought. Seriously, watch this video and tell me you don't want to slap Mike Rowe in his smug little face. Try. Try to do it. You can't. I don't believe you. Do you have a small project you'd like to abandon to the mercy of the eyeballs? Send me no more than one email at thoughtslimeeditor at gmail.com with the word eyeballs somewhere in the subject line and pertinent details like your pronouns and perhaps you will find yourself trapped here in the eyeball zone. Thanks for watching a video about some shitty jobs I had. If you liked it, press the like button. If you really liked it and you like what I do here and you want to see more of it, you can hit that subscribe button. You have the power to do it. Don't let them take that away from you. Give me some money if you want at patreon.com slash thoughtslime. That's where I go to get the money. Strong pitch. Good work. You can also find more of my videos over at youtube.com slash scaredycatstv and the occasional video game upload at youtube.com slash megaslimeentertainmentzone. I also stream here on YouTube and Twitch every Thursday at 8 p.m. Eastern Standard Time. New videos come out here on Thought Slime every 12 p.m. on Fridays Eastern Standard Time. So that's when those videos come out. They come out every week. People are always asking me, hey, Thought Slime, when's your next video coming out? I put them out every week. What are you talking about? How, do you, how did you not notice that I put them out every week on the same day, the same time? You're, you're a fake gamer.